Hi everyone, Scott Nicholson with the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation. Today, we're very excited to be interviewing Dr. Brendan Curdy. He's gonna be here talking with us with updates on immunotherapy treatments. Dr. Curdy is the Robert Franz Endowed Chair of Clinical Research. He's also the Director of the GU Oncology Research. He's a member of the Earl Childs Research Institute and the Providence Cancer Institute. Welcome, Dr. Curdy. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. So everyone, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of Dr. Curdy's talk. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat or just save them to the end and we'll make sure to get your questions answered then. Uh, so without further ado, uh, doctor, if you could share your screen and take us away. Very good. Give me just a moment. And hopefully everyone can uh, see the slides. Yes, sir. So um, again, uh, good morning or good afternoon and, and welcome. And um uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some selected uh, updates on uh, immunotherapy for, uh, for renal cancer. Um, these are my disclosures, uh, none of which are uh, relevant to any of the uh, content today, but I, I will disclose that I'm a true believer in immunotherapy and cancer research to help our patients. So before we talk about updates, I uh, think it's important that we should talk about, well, what is immunotherapy and, and really how does it work? So um, there are a number of different uh, subclasses or subtypes of immunotherapy. Um, what most people are familiar with are the so-called checkpoints. Uh, and I'm sure uh, everyone uh, participating today is familiar with things like uh, uh, Optivo nivolumab and uh, Keytruda pembrolizumab. Uh, but there, there's more to uh, checkpoints than that. I'll get into that in uh, some of the upcoming slides. Um, we'll talk a, a fair bit uh, today about uh, so-called adoptive transfer of immune cells. Uh, I'm sure many are familiar with the concept of CAR T or chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So that's one flavor of uh, immune cells that can be used for cancer treatment, but I'll be talking about a, a second variety or second flavor uh, later in, in the talk. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, some uh, so-called antibody drug conjugates, uh, which are engineered immune proteins that have the same sort of architecture as antibodies. All humans make antibodies, but no human will make uh, these uh, engineered uh, conjugates, but I'll talk a little bit about that technology and how it works. Um, there's been a fair bit in the news lately about uh, vaccines, of course, in the context of COVID, but also uh, at the most recent uh, ASCO, uh, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, there was uh, uh, a good bit of discussion about a melanoma vaccine, um, and which is based uh, more or less on very similar technology to how the uh, COVID vaccinations were built. Um, I will not be talking about vaccines today. I'll say with all humility, with over a, a century of work trying to find cancer vaccines, there are none uh, thus far that are um, approved by the FDA for advanced cancer, but there may be uh, some uh, recent insights that, that may change that uh, 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 sooner compared to later. So I'll also put in a plug for uh, uh, immunotherapy that's uh, not currently considered modern. And so uh, interleukin-2 or IL-2 is a medicine some of you may be familiar with. And uh, I sometimes refer to that as the uh, gateway drug for the, the current generation of uh, immunotherapies. Um, interferon also, you could say it has a, a checkered history, but, but also helped to establish some of the uh, proof of concepts that immunotherapy could be used to treat cancer. Um, although you can't see my gray hairs on the little uh, thumbnail picture that, that's being projected today, but I have plenty of them, and my career started at a time when immunotherapy was believed to be uh, maybe a nice idea, but entirely unworkable. Uh, some ref referred to it uh, as uh, impossible, and it should be abandoned. Uh, glad that that didn't actually happen, but it's really only been very recently that 
um, uh, immune therapies have come into their own. And uh, uh, again, these, uh, I'll say first generation agents still have some utility, but, but also provided some useful insights to the current uh, generation of, of treatments that are now uh, commonly offered to patients. So I'll do a little bit of a, a deeper dive on the uh, checkpoints. Uh, so what the heck is a checkpoint? Uh, you could think of it as uh, uh, control mechanisms or control signals for our body's T cells. Um, the way our body's T cells work, they uh, sense the environment through a whole bunch of proteins on the surface in this cartoon. Uh, uh, gives about uh, 10 or 12 of those proteins, but they're more like 250 or more. Um, and the cell, again, is sensing its environment and these different uh, proteins on the surface sometimes will latch on to other proteins that are floating about in the environment. And that can send a signal to stimulate the T cell. And that, that's uh, indicated on the uh, left uh, side of the T cell, and they're also substances that can slow down uh, or, or turn off a T cell. Um, you could think of this in very broad terms as uh, yin and yang, um, but by and large, our body's immune cells are configured in such a way that they're turned off. We certainly would not want our T cells to start nibbling on our lungs or colon or kidney or skin or any other you know, organ. Um, but I'll say there's a, a bias to uh, have our T cells turned off, except under very selected circumstances. Um, and so um, the inhibitory receptors that have the greatest influence on uh, T cell behavior are PD-1, the target of nivolumab or pembrolizumab, or CTLA-4, uh, the target of um, uh, ipilimumab, uh, also known as uh, Optivo. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, your boy. Um, so uh, on the left-hand side, I'll say there's a lot of important stuff going on there, but we have not been as successful in identifying therapeutic uh, agents uh, for the uh, activating receptors, but uh, it's still a worthy area of uh, uh, research. Uh, but, but again, our understanding of the uh, uh, activating receptors and how to manipulate them is not yet as uh, successful or sophisticated as uh, what we can do on the inhibitory side of the equation. So I'll indulge in an automotive uh, analogy to uh, try to describe how all of this works. And so for a T cell to uh, attack what is foreign in the body, uh, we'll say in this case, uh, a kidney cancer cell, the T cell first has to recognize something that is foreign, and that's an interaction between an antigen, a foreign protein, or a fragment of that protein. And that foreign substance is presented or shown to T cells um, in a complex of proteins uh, uh, known as MHC, uh, also known as HLA uh, proteins. But the point is that T cell is very fastidious in terms of its requirements for what it can uh, see as being normal versus abnormal. After that initial step, after the T cell senses there's something abnormal here, it needs more than that. It needs uh, some secondary signals in order to activate, and that's indicated um, uh, with uh, CD28. Um, uh, there are many other um, secondary signals, but that's uh, deemed one of the most important ones. In the lower left-hand side, you can see someone with their foot on the brake pedal. Um, and so giving medicines like ipilimumab or nivolumab or pembrolizumab is more or less like taking your foot off the brake. It removes some of these inhibitory signals. Um, I've inserted a subliminal message for uh, what interleukin-2 does. It provides a huge amount of uh, fuel or energy for an immune response. And uh, the hope of vaccines is uh, indicated in the lower uh, right-hand side uh, to perhaps steer an immune response uh, against uh, what is foreign in, in the body. So this is just a reminder of how far we've come over the last uh, 20 or so years. And so above the blue arrow are uh, mostly uh, immunotherapy examples, below the blue arrow are um, 
uh, mostly targeted therapies. And things started to change in the early part of this century, around uh, 2003, uh, early 2004, when medicines such as sunitinib and serafinib uh, first came to be. Um, just as a brief aside, uh, these medicines and the idea that you could block growth signals and specifically signals that uh, allow blood vessel formation uh, came about from knowledge of rare inherited kidney cancers, uh, for instance, in von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. An understanding of that rare inherited form of uh, kidney cancer uh, led to the insights uh, uh, that have led to all of the various uh, so-called TKI or targeted therapies uh, that we have. Um, you can see the timeline for um, uh, nivolumab, combination immunotherapies, combinations of TKI with uh, checkpoints. Um, most of what I'll talk about uh, here today is uh, at the far right-hand side of the slide with uh, CAR-T, antibody drug conjugates, and the idea of tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. So why, why has there been a uh, transformative uh, uh, evolution or change in kidney cancer? Well, you know, this is one illustration. And, and so this is a, a survival curve uh, comparing uh, pembrolizumab plus lenvatinib uh, with sunitinib monotherapy or a combination of two oral therapies. And so the uh, red line uh, is the... Uh, uh, immunotherapy-based treatment, as you can see at any point in time uh, in this clinical trial, there are more patients alive compared to um, TKI monotherapy or combinations of uh, oral uh, agents. This is another example of combined checkpoint uh, immunotherapy. And so the uh, orange, uh, uh, I guess that's ochre, I'm not sure, but at any rate, the, uh, the top curve uh, shows the survival of patients who received nivolumab and ipilimumab uh, compared to sunitinib. And again, at each point in time, there are more patients alive for having received the immune therapy. And so obvious clear advances uh, in, in uh, the care of our, our patients. This is another illustration of uh, immunobenefit. And so uh, this before and after CT scan um, is from a patient who has a, a more than 20 year journey with uh, her kidney cancer treatments. And so uh, she received uh, uh, treatment in the last century with uh, high dose interleukin 2. And when the uh, various uh, oral TKI therapies came about, she uh, received several of those, several clinical trials uh, with um, uh, newer agents. Um, but unfortunately, um, in 2019-ish, um, her uh, cancer was advancing, including um, uh, multiple uh, liver uh, metastatic deposits, uh, one of which is uh, illustrated by the blue arrows in the left uh, uh, portion of the slide. Uh, this patient received ipilimumab and nivolumab as um, actually her eighth line of therapy. And uh, uh, depicted on the right-hand side of the slide is significant uh, regression of this and uh, other uh, tumors. Um, you may notice there's some sort of whitish material in the uh, after slide, and that's calcium deposition, which usually means there's been uh, uh, an immunologic war within a tumor site, and uh, calcium gets deposited usually at the end of that amidst the debris of the uh, dead uh, cancer cells. Um, this patient uh, has been uh, uh, off of treatment uh, for more than three years. And although her scans don't look entirely normal, but yet nothing has grown or changed and uh, her journey continues, which of course is the, uh, uh, the uh, meaning and, and uh, point of all of this, of all of what we do. So what is the future of uh, immunotherapy for kidney cancer? And I all, uh, channel Yogi Berra, who uh, was purported to say that it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, but uh, I'll offer my uh, uh, biased views of uh, some potential uh, futures for our um, treatments of kidney 
cancer. And so the first example I'll provide um, is from uh, uh, an engineered tea cell. Uh, and this is one of the many flavors of car tea. And so this is a T cell uh, designed to uh, recognize a protein that's on about 80% of clear cell cancers, roughly 50% of papillary uh, renal cancers known as CD70. Um, CD70 is also found on some normal cells, but only under, uh, I'll say fairly astringent uh, conditions. It's usually only transiently um, uh, found. It also points out a bigger issue. If you pick a target on a cancer cell, you wanna make sure that that same target is also not present on a normal cell because obviously you don't want your immune therapy to be um, uh, attacking uh, normal tissues. Um, this particular example of CAR-T is an off the shelf product. So it's made from T cells that are uh, donated by uh, healthy uh, normal donors. And those T cells are changed in the lab. And so uh, certain genes are snipped out, others are added. And what you get at the end of it is a T cell that um, can recognize, again, the target of CD70. And once it recognizes that target, uh, the T cell can be triggered to attach, uh, excuse me, to attack the, the uh, uh, cancer cell that it is attached to. Um, like many of these studies, um, the treatment is more complex than just uh, coming to the clinic for your uh, uh, cell infusion. Uh, there are more moving parts, including conditioning regimen uh, therapy. What is conditioning? Well, basically, in order for these or other flavors of immune cells to work, they need room to grow in the body after they're administered. And so a number of things have been tried, but chemotherapy medicines, uh, specifically cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, seem to do the best job of making room. Uh, another analogy that I would offer is that they, in a way, reboot the body's immune system to make it more conducive to the transfused cells, but also to help those cells to sustain themselves after the infusion. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, on day zero, patients get the cells, and then there's follow-up uh, imaging and laboratories to try and understand where these cells go and uh, what they're doing after they uh, are administered. Um, of course, with any new therapy, we're obliged to look for side effects. Um, and, and in particular for CAR-T therapy, there's a concern about so-called CRS or cytokine release. Um, basically the downstream immune effects from the cells. So some of that is needed to kill off the cancer, but too much of that is uh, maybe not so good. Compared to other CAR-T, these cells are fairly straightforward to give, although there was cytokine release, but most of that was uh, mild to medium and, and not severe. In some CAR-T, there can be uh, neurological side effects. People can get headaches, become confused, have other changes uh, uh, in their memory or uh, ability to think. Um, again, mild uh, in most of these patients, uh, but there were uh, some individuals where it was a little more severe, but, but resolved. Um, as you might expect, if you're giving chemotherapy as part of the treatment, blood counts might go down and there might be risk of infection. That certainly did happen uh, uh, with, with this therapy. And so this is a so-called uh, waterfall plot uh, depicting um, the change in tumor size um, in these patients. And so um, something you could say expected, but those patients who had more CD70 on their tumors had a much higher chance of their tumor shrinking with this sort of therapy. Um, and so that was certainly confirmed by this observation of, of the first um, uh, 18 or so patients. Um, and I would also emphasize, and although you know everyone, everyone would like to see all of the bars go down, that means that um, the tumor is shrinking, but this is in the setting of patients who had three or four or more prior therapies. So this is uh, a result, uh, I would say, uh, of interest uh, in heavily pretreated patients. 
This is uh, another series of scans of an individual patient that uh, I had the privilege uh, of caring for. And so in the top three uh, scans, uh, the blue arrows are showing uh, kidney cancer metastatic deposits in the lungs. Uh, the bottom three panels uh, are depicting a shrinkage of uh, uh, those sites. And so again, th this is a, a treatment that um, uh, is certainly worthy of further uh, investigation. Um, but uh, CD70 uh, selection of patients uh, appears very important to this uh, technology. I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about an antibody drug conjugate, but one that also targets uh, CD70. I'll get to that in the next slide, but just to talk a little bit more about what these substances are, and they're being developed in colon cancer and leukemia and a variety of other uh, cancer types. But you know, an antibody is an immune protein, but one that um, is uh, designed to stick very specifically to a protein and not just generally stick to anything uh, in the body. And so um, these antibodies can be changed so that they not only stick to something that's abnormal, but to deliver a payload, in this case, a chemotherapy medicine to the target, but not again, generally throughout the body. And so as a proposed mechanism, uh, this antibody drug conjugate will percolate through the bloodstream and the interstitial, the in-between spaces uh, in different tissues, including within the tumor. Uh, the um, uh, antibody drug conjugate will stick to the cancer cells uh, within the tumor deposit. Uh, a lot of these substances are engineered to either be ingested by the cell or um, they're um, uh, cleaved or split at the cell, but that releases the uh, chemotherapy medicine or the payload to uh, the cancer cell. And uh, uh, if all goes according to plan, uh, the chemo uh, substance will uh, uh, kill the cancer cell that it uh, is released next to. So this is a specific uh, antibody drug conjugate um, targeting CD70, which, which uh, has just opening. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, kidney cancer is not the only type of cancer that expresses CD70. There are also um, uh, certain uh, head and neck cancers that express it, and uh, also uh, some non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphomas. Um, the particular chemotherapy medicine is something called exatecan. Some of you may be thinking, my doctor never told me about chemo for kidney cancer, and there's a good reason for that. Most chemotherapies do not work in kidney cancer because the kidney cancer cells have the ability to actually pump out the specific chemo medicine. This particular substance, the exatecan, uh, it cannot be pumped out by the kidney cancer cell. And it was selected, again, with that deliberate um, uh, or with that knowledge uh, in mind. Um, it can deliver a lethal dose. The exotecan can be lethal to the cancer cell. Um, with all humility, though, although this works great in mouse models of kidney cancer, the human model is a good bit more complex. Uh, and so... Uh, we don't know the response rate of this substance, but uh, another example of a targeted therapy for uh, kidney cancer that works very differently from other medicines that are currently available. So the last um, example of um, a potential future path for immunotherapy in renal cancer um, is a TIL-based uh, therapy. And so what are TIL? Well, so you can see tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, immune cells that are uh, in, embedded in or find their way into tumors. Um, this general form of therapy is also sometimes referred to as adoptive cellular therapy. The idea of this came about actually in the 1980s. So obviously it's been around for a good, a good while. Um, but it's not easy to do. Uh, but some recent advances in cell culture technique, 
uh, ha have made it uh, much more uh, scalable, um, and not just in kidney cancer, but in other cancers. I, melanoma has been the tumor in which this has been uh, studied the, the most. Um, there's a fundamental problem with this, and although there have been some very interesting uh, uh, responses over the years, uh, and some of which I had the privilege of taking care of some patients back in the early days at NIH, uh, where the, this uh, uh, technology was being developed, and some of the people treated in the late 80s and early 90s are still alive and well and with us, and, and that's fabulous, but getting it to work consistently is, is no small matter. And part of it relates to the fact that the immune cells in the tumor are not all specific in trying to kill the tumor. A lot of them are, are bystanders that are there for reasons of the blood circulation or, uh, or the like. And figuring out how to separate the ones that are tumor killing versus the ones that are bystanders is, is not so easy, but there may be a way to do that, which I'll get into in, in just a moment. And, and so, uh, how might we pick the, um, uh, the most tumor reactive cells? Well, uh, Dr. Andy Weinberg, whose uh, office is uh, two doors down from uh, where I'm sitting uh, here today, um, his laboratory had an insight that the cells within the tumor that have two proteins on their surface, one known as CD39, the other known as CD103, if both of those proteins are there, that is an indirect but very powerful marker for the tumor reactive cells. And so the three graphs you see with the uh, red uh, dots uh, indicate that the so-called, we call them double positive cells, they have much more tumor fighting ability compared to single positive cells, cells that only have one of um, the two marker proteins or what we call double negative cells, T cells that lack either of the two uh, proteins. Um, there's more to be said about the biology of these cells, but clearly they're the most efficient tumor killers. Um, and so the idea is, well, gee, if we could um, routinely uh, get these out of a tumor specimen, maybe we could turn that into a personalized cancer treatment. And so the overall process for doing this, uh, the surgeon removes a tumor specimen. Um, and I should have mentioned in the last slide, but these so-called double positive cells are in pretty much all of the different cancer types we've looked at. They're in melanoma, they're in ovarian cancer, they're in head and neck cancers, they're present in kidney cancers in different degrees though. And so an average tumor might have somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 uh, of these very tumor-specific cells. So uh, again, the way this technology works, the uh, surgeon uh, does a harvest of the tumor. The tumor is broken up uh, mechanically uh, and also with some enzymes. Um, we have a cell sorter, um, and it's made by the same company that might make your TV set, but they also make medical devices. Um, and so we can separate these so-called double positives from all of the rest of the immune cells in the sample. There's a technology for growing these cells to numbers literally in the billions. Um, and then we can give the patient uh, their uh, cell product. Um, I think the patient is reading a medical journal. So uh, we, we have very uh, informed patients. So uh, uh, and I know all of you are as well, but uh, we hope that this will be potentially an outpatient therapy uh, eventually. This is a more granular detail about the treatment plan, but this also starts out with the conditioning regimen chemotherapy using cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, something that we discussed before. The patient gets their cells, and these particular cells are also very dependent on interleukin-2. So although you could say that's a Jurassic area, uh, era immunotherapy, uh, it is very important to the uh, life and well-being of T cells. And we've done other laboratory uh, studies to um, uh, show that these cells don't do well without the interleukin-2. So that's a, a necessary part of this treatment. Of course, we're trying to understand how these cells work, where they go, how long they stay in the tumor. That's all part of this uh, study. So I'll, I'll just um, 
uh, wrap up with uh, a few conclusions and, and observations. Um, so immunotherapy clearly has improved survival for patients with advanced renal cancer. Um, immunotherapy or any medical therapy, although it improves survival, unfortunately, it rarely cures patients with, with kidney cancer or other solid tumors. Um, thankfully, there are many new ideas. And although immunotherapy is now, you could say it's uh, well into its uh, second decade of uh, uh, practical use, but um, uh, still many, many uh, new ideas uh, worthy of uh, investigation. And I'll um, end with the uh, uh, statement of humility that renal cancer is not a solved problem. And in my opinion, uh, cancer research is the only way we're going to find better ways to help our, our patients and not just slow down the progression of their disease, but to eliminate their disease. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to field any questions. Thank you, doctor. And and as you mentioned, uh, cancer research is is vital to this. And that leads into our first question, really, from, from Deb. Um, it's, it's, her question was, there's a lot of interest regarding CAR-T in our patient communities. Uh, given these are phase one trials, when do you think it makes sense for a kidney cancer patient volunteer to volunteer for a CAR-T trial? For example, if they already had two or three prior treatments or earlier? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and so there's um, a very reasonable, um, and I'll say common sense notion that uh, sooner might be better. Uh, and um, the more lines of treatment that somebody has, the more chance there is for uh, the patients to have some uh, significant side effect that doesn't completely resolve after their third or fourth or fifth line of treatment, but, but it also, uh, for those patients that need that many lines of treatment, the, the obvious implication is that the cancer has persisted because it has become more resistant. And so cancers become more resistant by uh, getting rid of the proteins that the immune system is trying to use to eliminate them. And so there are many examples. You could think of it as uh, a, uh, a criminal uh, removing their fingerprints, uh, for instance. And so there are ways that cancer cells can immune, uh, can avoid immune evasion and do other things to turn off or, or deflect uh, T cells. Um, with any sort of therapy that is more toxic, and I would say CAR-T, at least in its current application, is a treatment associated with a fair number of side effects. Um, and so I would say in the, you know, after the second line of therapy is a reasonable time to think about something like this. Uh, not as reasonable after the fourth or fifth line of therapy. Now I, I'm inserting, uh, I'll say a little bit of bias plus uh, some scientific knowledge to, to make that comment, um, and I'll just offer my opinion that, you know, after the second line, although there are lots of treatments available, that's different than we know the best treatment that will extend that patient's life. And I would say, again, with humility, we truly do not understand that, even though many of my colleagues would say, well, I routinely use such and such in the third line. And so that's all well and good. Um, there is always a balance of risk and benefit. That's true with the standard treatment, but uh, uh, even more true with an experimental treatment. And so with, with a quote unquote standard or FDA approved treatment, there is some knowledge about the response probability, but honestly, rarely is that stated in the third or fourth line of treatment. It's usually in the first or second line. With experimental treatment, as I'm sure the sophisticated audience understands, a lot of phase one studies, really the purpose of them is to define side effects. And that's a very different endpoint than effectiveness. Everyone would wanna sign up for something that works 100% and guaranteed. And obviously uh, that would be great if we could have that you know, on offer. Uh, but, but again, I, I think 
um, for a patient who's willing to accept some risk and also the standard treatments are still there <laughs> after participation in a clinical trial. So uh, I would say it would be reasonable to consider this sort of therapy in the, in the third line, but no one size fits all. Thank you, doctor. If anyone else has questions, um, you can type them into the chat. Um, Deb had a follow-up question. Uh, can Dr. Curdy tell us his thoughts on patients taking an immunotherapy after one immunotherapy has already failed? For example, Pembro after Ipinevo or vice versa? Yeah, yeah. Excellent question. Um, and um, I know that there's a great deal of that that is you know, practiced out there. And I'll confess, I've, I've done it myself in recommendations to the patients that, that I see. There was a, um, a recent study, uh, it was actually just published, or just presented, I should say, at the um, uh, ASCO meeting that, that happened in early July of this year, the, the so-called CONTACT-03 study. And so the question that that study sought to answer was, after progression in the first or second line from immunotherapy, what's best, another immunotherapy or uh, a targeted therapy? And the specific uh, therapies that were compared head to head were um, a velumab, which is an anti pdl one antibody, uh, plus cabozantinib versus cabozantinib uh, oral therapy alone. And so the bottom line from that study was the uh, oral therapy alone was just as good as the combination and had fewer side effects and just as good measured in terms of the objective response, the percent of patients whose skin showed some improvement and also uh, no difference in terms of the so-called progression-free survival, the time it took for the cancer to uh, advance. Um, some, uh, you could say that's a little bit of a discouraging result. Um, I, I, and I won't disagree with that, but I, I, I'll emphasize that um, to the extent that checkpoints such as ipilimumab or pembrolizumab or, or nivolumab work, they're really working on immune cells that have already recognized that the tumor is foreign and, and needs to be eliminated. So really all of our current era of immunotherapies are, are based on that assumption. Mm. For the patients who progress, uh, especially in the first line, that means that those patients did not have a strong enough uh, native immune response to amplify. And so as a matter of biology, trying something else is reasonable. In our own practice, and uh, as you may have uh, inferred from my uh, uh, slides and the uh, logos for the Research Institute uh, that, that are on every slide, that you know, we do have a bias toward cancer research in general and, and clinical research in, in particular. Um, and um, so the other thing I would say is that a checkpoint to salvage a checkpoint um, the odds of a true complete response is diminishingly small. And so uh, I think there are some patients who benefit, but the majority do not. Hmm. Um, a, a question from our, if, you, if we still have a, let's see, how are we on time? We have a time for one more, doctor? Of course, yes. Hmm. Um, are there any lifestyle changes or complementary therapies uh, that can support the success of immunotherapy for kidney cancer? Yeah, I, there, there's a lot uh, claimed in that regard. Um, and, uh, you know, many diet uh, claims. Um, at the end of the day, the so-called Mediterranean diet is uh, the most practical and, and effective. And, and there are some good data about uh, immune, uh, the beneficial immune effects of a, a Mediterranean uh, style diet. Um, 
regular exercise. Uh, the starter package is 20 minutes a day. It could be more. Um, I'm not suggesting it has to be you know triathlete training either, but uh, but exercise actually improves uh, the function of immune cells, uh, as well as having many other health benefits. There's an interesting area of research looking at altering the so-called microbiome bacteria in our digestive tracts, which can influence all, all sorts of different health things, including immune uh, response. It, it's a very interesting area of research, uh, but not one where we've reliably shown how to alter gut flora in a way that would consistently improve um, mm. therapy. Uh, but I think that eventually we may figure that out. Um, uh, but for the moment, I would say... Uh, it's difficult because everyone's different. Um, yeah. and their, their lifestyles are going to be completely different. So to have one specific right. answer for... For everybody, is it going to work? But um, but I appreciate the question. And thank you so much for your time, Dr. Curdy. Uh, this is uh, always an exciting topic. Um, Deb says, excellent presentation. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone attending today. If you missed any part of this, uh, this webinar, uh, you'll be able to check it out on our website shortly. So just stay tuned. You can follow us on Facebook or just... Uh, Sign up for our newsletter on our website and you'll continue to receive uh, updates on uh, symposiums and um, the other types of support systems that we're, we're putting out there like this. One. So uh, thanks again, Dr. Curdy. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Everyone have a great day. I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.